Hi, welcome to Law and Justice. I'm Jane Mulcahy. This is a special series on the topic of relationships matter. And today I am really excited to be joined by Dr. Thomas Sexton. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hey, Jane. How are you doing? Thanks very much for the offer. And thanks very much for having me. This will be really fun. Uh, I hope so. I really do. Um, so to get started, Tom, can you just tell me a bit about yourself and your background, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll let me start with recent and kind of go back because I think there's some going back kind of answers that may inform the rest of what we talk about. So right now, I'm lucky enough to be a retired academic. So I survived the academic world. I was a professor at University of Nevada, Las Vegas, and at Indiana University for almost 30 years between the two. Um, while I was there, I'm a fellow of the American Psychological Association. I'm a board certified couple and family family psychologist. I've involved in kind of the professional world some, but mostly involved in the research and writing world. So I have six books, um, you know, 75 or so articles on various different things, including FFT, which uh, apropos for this discussion is very much about relationships, mm -hmm. uh, but other things too, like what evidence-based practices are, you know, trying to help our world overcome a bit the worry and the fear of using science. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of working with people. So I've written a lot about that. But I come to the academic world in an interesting way. Um, I didn't come out of graduate, I didn't come out of undergraduate school and go directly into my professional role. Um, I have, actually have kind of a funny story. When I was an undergraduate at University of Missouri, I had aspirations of going to graduate school. The downside is I didn't get into any. Okay. And that, <laughs> that was lucky changes. probably. <laughs> You know, it turns out it was really lucky, but at the time it really felt like, oh, now what am I going to do? Yeah. So the downside of not getting into school is you have to do something. So you have, and in this case, it was go to work and live with my parents again. Okay. So I moved to this, back to this very small town in, in Southwest Missouri and started looking for a job. And the only job I could find was in a group home with okay. adolescent boys that had been in the juvenile justice system that had been removed from their homes. The fascinating thing was I was 22 years old and the rest wow. of the staff were mm. young too. We had no clue what we were doing. I mean, we were taking these kids that had been taken away from their home, put in a group home, their whole lives disrupted, right? And we were supposed to be helpful. And it wasn't that we were badly trained. I don't think mm. the world knew what to do with kids at sure. that point. But one of the most fascinating things happened to me. I would watch them during the week and they were great. And I would watch them on their weekend when their families came and something changed. Mm. And so it began, this thought began for me, what is the story? I mean, you know, we have these individual kids and they're doing great and something about those relationships automatically pulls them back into some set of patterns that they were in before that make it really difficult for them. So, you know, I worked in the group home for a number of years, and then I went and started to work in what in America we call Outward Bound, which is, okay. it's like um, um, uh, challenge-based out, outward out activities in the woods okay. and things like that. So my job was to take 10 kids, juvenile delinquents from big cities in Missouri into the woods for 28 days. Oh, so wow, my partner, Tom. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Yeah, so I, I got really lucky and I had about three years of living in a tent with a backpack and that was a month on and a month off. But the, the, and the, same, the same experience happened to me, which is in 28 days, those kids were different, mm. fundamentally different. And they went home and they went back to the way they were in a heartbeat. Mm. Now, did that mean we didn't do a good job? Did that mean the activities weren't good? Does that mean there was something else happening? Mm -hmm. So I got really curious about those things. And that's what really set me off as interested. I didn't know at the time it was families. And I didn't know at the time it was systems thinking, relationally based systems mm -hmm. thinking that I was really intrigued with. But, you know, before that, I came from, a, I have a very odd younger background. I came from a military family. So okay. I never lived in I never lived in one place for more than a year. I moved like 15 times right. before I got to so, so, you know, whether all of that early upbringing, you know, kind of directed me to being interested in family, because that's all we ever had in all mm. that movie, but I don't know. But, but I came out of it and I went into graduate school really interested in this concept of family. And we're really interested in the concept of, of how does that all work? And, and I was really lucky at Florida State. I was around some systems thinkers 
And that would have been in, you know, the middle beginning 1980s when systems thinking was really, really proliferating our field. And I got fascinated by that stuff. And that just set me off on a journey. And then in Las Vegas, when I was a professor, I got really lucky and I ran into Jim Alexander. Jim okay. Alexander, the original progenitor of FFT. And I remember going to a workshop, Jane, and watching him just, it was amazing. He did family therapy with 100 people. It was phenomenal. Wow. And so I knew there was something to this. So Jim and I struck up a relationship then. And that's where that's where FFT and the national and international stage came from. Because from there, you know, we started working on training organizations and different things like that. Then we were just lucky, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, because the luck was this. The luck yeah. was in America in the late, in middle 1990s, they figured out that the services that the kids, adolescents, and the justice system were getting didn't work. Mm -hmm. And there was this final cost effectiveness study right. in Washington by Steve Ost and Barney Barnowski. Yeah. Terrific guys. And you know what they what it, they just defunded probation and they had to do something else. So they brought in these programs like FFT and MST, multi-systemic mm -hmm. therapy, into the and that was really a major professional culture change. It brought these programs that had been languishing in journals and handbooks and the, the academic literature into the into the public community based literature. And what was nice about it is we made a big difference. But the better thing was then these models got to evolve mm -hmm. because then we were really practicing in the real community. We weren't doing just research studies. Yeah, we were out teaching regular practitioners with real families that were diverse. And that's where FFT really began. I think it's a major evolution into something that's very practical and something to be very helpful. Thanks for that. Hey, not, a, not, a, not a short answer to no, you. No, no, but, but really, really interesting. I knew some of it, but I didn't obviously know the origins with the with the group home and the tent. That was that was great. Um, so then FFT, functional family therapy, who is it actually for? Is it for the young people with offending behavior or their families or both? <clears throat> it's even bigger than that. Okay. Um, and, the, and it speaks to what FFT a little bit is. FFT, mm -hmm. it, and this is a thing I've written about that I, I think we have to come to grips with in the profession. Models like FFT, any model, they don't stay stagnant. They mm -hmm. should change. It should evolve over time, right? So FFT started in 1969 in Utah with white males coming out of a residential facility. Okay. The world is different now. It's yes. very, very different. I mean, we're doing FFT in Ireland and in mm -hmm. the Greentown Project. That's mm -hmm. not Utah. No. It is different. So the nice thing about FFT is it's evolved and it continues to evolve all the time. We're always learning new things. We're always refining our training. So, so who is it for? It started off in the juvenile justice world. So very much like what we're doing in the Greentown Project, right? It was for youth who were offending, caught in the justice system. And that's where it began. And it was there for a very long time. But then things began to change, right? The, the kind of, I see these almost as silos of practice, juvenile justice. Mm -hmm. And then in America, we have a very, very complex and, and, and huge child welfare system right. that includes foster care, that includes prevention, maltreatment, all those. FFT is now very much a prevention program in child welfare and in behavioral health, behavioral slash mental health. Okay. You know, that area of youth who it's not necessarily behavior problems like a juvenile delinquent have, but very much around mental health issues. FFT has evolved into a program that can work with that. Mm -hmm. In addition, it's a program that works really well with substance abusing youth. Okay. Right? But your question was a bit different than that. That's the context. Mm -hmm. Your question was who is for the youth or the family? And I would say those are not separable. Those mm -hmm. are inexplicably tied together. So I think when you change the family, you change the youth. I think mm -hmm. when you change the youth, you change the family. Yeah. So I see it, I see it at FFT is oriented towards changing the relational context in which that youth lives. Now, the long-term goal, of course, is that they stop bad behavior, mm -hmm. right? Or they mentally healthy or, or in a in a child protection in a child welfare context it's very much about helping parents protect their kids 
keeping them emotionally and physically safe. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it is, FFT is really evolved, but the core is around your question, which mm -hmm. is, it is both. And from our perspective, it, it, you can't separate one from the other. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so one thing, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but the this podcast, Law and Justice, the previous series on how to talk policy and influence people, and this one, Relationship Matters, I've um, interviewed quite a lot of psychologists, and I'm very interested in therapeutic modalities. And I now know there are many, many of them, and they have lots of different theoretical frameworks. Um, so you mentioned systems theory there earlier. What what theories or approaches kind of influence functional functional family therapy, Tom? I wish I could give a really uh, an easy answer to that, but given FFT has been around forty plus years. And the, the profession has changed and evolved over that time. There's no simple answer. So okay. in the early days, FFT was seen as like the second generation of core family theories. There was Salmanuchin and structural family therapy. There was Bowen and his intergenerational approach. There was, there was Haley and Madonna's with their, what was called a strategic approach. And then of course, there were the MRI folks that looked at systems in terms of patterns, et cetera. Mm -hmm. FFT is the next generation of those. Okay. So it is informed by, initially, when it was formed, it was informed by all of those. Mm -hmm. So there are pieces of MRI in it. There are pieces of strategic approaches. There are, strategic, there are elements of the structural approach. But over time, we've learned a lot more. Things have mm -hmm. changed. And the way we think about people and things have changed. So over time, there have been other influences. For example, there's a constructivist influence. Now, I, from our perspective, that is a social constructivist perspective. Okay. It's all about the construction of meaning around relationships, right? So it's very relationship focused in that way. Mm -hmm. And it's also been formed by behavioral theories, right? Okay. In terms of patterns of things and interactions between people. So FFT has had, an, and, and then there's the work on attachment. Yeah, I was you know, going to ask. Yeah, when FFT first started, that word was not in the professional literature. Mm. And so the early ideas of Cole Barton and Jim Alexander in FFT described what we now talk about as attachment as relational functions. Okay. Right. Their, their early idea was that people get something out of relationships. That's where the functional, that's where part uh -huh. of the word functional. The other part of functional comes from, you know, you do what works. You know, yes. your approach should be functionally based one. So their idea was attachments were all about things in which people got connected and, excuse me, and got glued together in that mm -hmm. way. So FFT has got multiple influences, but a, a, another way to think about it, it is a theory. Yeah. FFT is not just a series of interventions. It has with it a core set of ideas about how relationships work, a core set of ideas about how change happens, and a core set of ideas about how best to practice and intervene with people to help them be more functional. Thank you, Tom. And you mentioned as well, uh, you know, the, the good fortune that you had in the, in the 90s when um, probation started to be defunded and you had to find something else <clears throat> to do with, with youngsters in conflict with the law. So there's a lot of evidence to support uh, FFT. Um, can you tell me some of the, the findings from studies that have, I suppose, differentiated the young people and families who've successfully passed through the phases of FFP <clears throat> versus the ones that don't or have problems doing so? This is a really great question because of the way you ask the question. You ask the question, which families does it work for? And my answer is going to be an interesting one because... <laughs> We have now 20 plus randomized clinical trials over 40 years. And, you know, I would say another 50 plus evaluations and qualitative studies, you know, semi <coughs> quasi experimental studies. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that in our work, we evaluate every program we do every year. So we mm -hmm. evaluate all our work in a research study every year. And I can talk about that in a bit. So here are the findings. The findings are interesting. It isn't the family. It's the therapist. Ah. The difference lies in the therapist. So FFT has been effective in Ireland. FFT has been effective <coughs> in Utah. FFT has been effective in Norway. FFT, 
the list goes on and on. And in so many diverse groups, families, and ethnic groups in New York City, I mean, we now deal with, uh, we deliver FFT in some 20 languages in New York City. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's delivered all over the world in different languages. It isn't the family. <clears throat> and surprisingly, FFT can cross culture. So what is the variable? Because everyone isn't successful. There's mm -hmm. no question about that. So our, our work shows that it is the degree to which the therapist does two things. First, that they follow the model, right? Okay. So they're, they're in, and the in the field, we call it fidelity. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. So early measures of fidelity were these micro measures of did the, what the therapists do or say match exactly the model. <clears throat> what we found is that those kids, those therapists who followed the model had astounding positive results. And those that didn't had results, I wouldn't say they were harmful results, but their results were no better than nothing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is about the therapist. But the second variable that we've discovered more recently, it isn't just blindly following a series of steps. It's the creativity within which the therapist follows those steps. So I sort of see it not as a line, like a one, two, three, mm -hmm. but I see it as a, a lane and a lane being a wide berth that's still fidelity, but that all has to do with matching to the family. Mm -hmm. So the, the whole point of FFT and one of our big training issues is how could I teach Jane to see the right things in a family and adjust what they do to mm -hmm. fit the family? rather than expect, expecting the family to fit to them. Now, if I go back to my psychotherapy training, I was always taught to do something that fit me. Right. No one <laughs> ever, ever taught me that I shouldn't be worried about myself. I should take the responsibility of being diverse and being able to change, but I should, I should let the family be themselves and match mm. to them. And that's the FFT approach. That's mm. why it is a relationship focused approach mm. because the therapist not only has to follow the model, but they have to follow the model and adjust many small things along the way to fit the way that family works. Yeah. Because our goal is not to change the personality of the family. Our goal is to really change how they work within the structure that they currently have. Mm. So otherwise we'd be homogenizing families, right? And yeah. that isn't the goal at all. Instead, we want to empower them to be themselves. It sounds a small bit like um, attunement, I guess, that the, the therapist tries to attune themselves to the needs and listen to the family if they're saying, this isn't working for me right now, you know, or we need to pause here or something. And 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 that. I remember hearing you actually, um, I don't know, it's a good 10 years ago now at a conference in Dublin organized by the Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice. And I remember you talking about fidelity to the model and that that creativity with the, within the bounds of the model itself. And um, I imagine that that for some therapists might be difficult because they want to follow the manual and do it correctly. And then there's the whole recording system that you have to ensure fidelity, but then to kind of go with their gut, I, I guess, a bit some of the time too, and, and, and shift things up in order to meet the needs and um, yeah, to, to help. There's a phrase as well, isn't there in FFT about the therapeutic alliance? Can you can you maybe say a, a, a little bit more about yeah. that? Like, how does a therapist, let's say the young person and the family, they're a bit ambivalent, which I presume is not uncommon. They're not no. they're not sure they want to do this, really. They're not sure they want to open up and talk about the difficulties within the family dynamics. How does a therapist um kind of attune in order to get in the door and and build that kind of um, safety and trust? So part of it comes from understanding what your role is, okay. right? So it starts with the therapist understanding what their job is, right? So if the therapist's job is to fix the family, they're going to be in deep trouble because then they're not attuning to the family. They're attuning to a measure or a prototype or a you know, an archetype that they have in their head and they're trying to make the family fit that. If you see your job as a change agent, if you see your job as a, as a guide and a coach rather than a, a director, mm -hmm. then it's a different story. 
it's a little like leading someone through the woods, right? You're following a pathway, you're leading them through, but they're doing it. So when the therapist starts to look at their role in the therapeutic relationship as a guide, it opens the door for something I think is really interesting, which is we've all been taught, first of all, in the early days of our work, it was therapists were the smart people and they knew what was right. Mm -hmm. Then in our world, it switched, right? And it was families know what is right. So, you know, with the whole solution focused approach and all of those things, it was always like families have a solution somewhere in there. I don't know about that, right? <laughs> you know, families get caught in a way of doing things like we all do. But what was missed is that doesn't mean that they're not an expert. Mm. So from an FFT perspective, the therapeutic relationship is very much one of two experts, not one, not just mm -hmm. the family, but the therapist has an expertise too. And their expertise is to help the family move through a series of change steps. And that's really what FFT has evolved to be. Mm -hmm. It's not about the right way to be. It's about helping them move through a series of change steps, right? That we might all go through in a variety of different things. So when the therapist understands that with their role, then the therapeutic relationship changes. It becomes a relationship of two experts each with different roles, each with different tasks, but it takes an alliance between the experts in order to accomplish the ultimate goal, which is positive change and helping families move, move ahead. <clears throat> so long explanation, but what does the therapist need to do? For a, First of all, the therapist needs to take the perspective that you talked about, which is mm -hmm. attunement. Mm -hmm. They need to be attuned to how the family works. And part of engagement is coming in and first of all, respecting the, the role of both parties. That means that therapists also have to be willing to be assertive and take their role as directing conversations, moving people forward, knowing what's next. Mm -hmm. Families don't know that, but not trying to own how to be. That right there is an attitude. That's a therapeutic attitude that you come in with. And if you, you can't, you can't, there's no intervention to show that. It's a, it's, it's a, it's an attitude. So it kind of comes out of the pores of your skin, right? Mm -hmm. Families feel that. Families yeah. feel when you do two things, not just when you say, oh, you know everything, but when they say, you know how to be, yet I can help you. So part of what overcomes ambivalence is this being able to let them be an expert but establish yourself as an expert in change mm. so that you have something relevant to offer them. Sure. And you're doing it in a way that is respectful. Mm -hmm. So it really ends up having to be two things. Therapists make a lot of mistakes with this. For example, sometimes they lean to the side of just saying the family's always right. Mm. Well, Jane, you and I know what happens in the Greentown Project. If, if you come yeah. in and you're that soft and you have nothing to offer, you're done, yeah. right? You're out, right? Because you... On the other hand, therapists can go the other direction, be too directive, but in that sweet middle spot is enough of, I can help you. I know how to do this. I have the skill, but it's about you. It's about empowering you. Mm -hmm. So when they can create that kind of, of both, both and, families open up. Now, again, do they open up and tell you all their stories about everything? No, but they don't need to. Yes. They don't need to, because when you take a systemic perspective, you don't need to know the whole story. You don't need to know all the dirty details. You don't need to know all the history. Mm -hmm. You get to see what's in front of you when you're working with them. And you can see the patterns between mm -hmm. them. You can see the meaning that they, mm -hmm. that they have within those patterns. You can see the way in which they're attached. And by that attunement approach, you're fitting to them. And I think that draws them in, mm -hmm. makes them gives you credibility, it makes them feel respected, and you create the relationship alliance between them. Mm. That's the key. To this. Uh, one thing as well that struck me there as you were talking is like, is it important to, to get that buy-in initially when people, not only might some be ambivalent, particularly in Greentown, some might really not want to do it at all. And they're kind of, they, 
they say okay because of persistence or whatever, but they're they're reluctant to say the least and maybe hostile. Um, but do you think it matters in terms of the therapist's attitude that they convey fairly quickly that actually I really do care, you know, because sometimes <clears throat> that sense of caring might be lacking, you know, it's kind of, um, well, I care, but what I care about is the criminal justice outcomes really, rather than immediately what your needs are or how how things are for you right here, right now, and the wider kind of, sometimes there can be huge chaos or serious illness or suicides or serious addiction I really care about trying to help you move forward in that a little bit I think you're exactly right Jane and and the how you convey that I really care is the key element, mm. right so there's a couple ways to convey it you can say I really care that's mm. a good thing to do mm. right but you can show you really care right and that's where you really get uh, a lot of that's where you really get a lot of movement in therapy is when you also demonstrate that you care. So, for example, what you said about the chaos mm. and all the different things that go on in the family, right? So, I never start with "tell me the bad things you've done." Yeah, <clears throat> you know what I start with is what's going on between you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I start with something quite simple, yeah. right? Because for me, the 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 bad behavior, the criminal behavior, is just part of a pattern. Mm. it's part of the bigger thing it you know and if you change the pattern this is about your topic relationships matter mm. if you change the relationship patterns you open up the possibility that people's behavior changes as well mm -hmm. because from our perspective behavior is so inexorably tied to relationship patterns that you all you can't separate them as i said mm. before so again, I, I don't ever start with, tell me about your bad behavior. Mm. So you build alliance by talking about what's important to them. Yeah. Now you're still talking about the bad behavior, mm. but you're just doing it very indirectly mm -hmm. because the patterns and all the mechanisms that produce the bad behavior, are the same ones that produce the good behavior, Yeah. right? They're the same way of working. So we begin with what goes on between you. And from there, what we discover is, first of all, how they work together. And in, ours, and in our belief, if we watch how they work together and we assume that that's kind of the core pattern, and then we continue to assess that. But then we're also interested in the meaning that goes with the patterns. Mm. That's where the critical part is. And that's where the social constructivist perspective mm. comes in. That's where the perspective of meaning comes in. So behavior can mean lots of different things mm. to people. You know, the meaning of a behavior is in the eye of the beholder, not right. in behavior. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's part of the Greentown issue, right? Yeah. Is that some of the parents don't see the bad behavior as bad. Mm. And so therefore, you know, we've got a bit of a difficulty. So we also look for the meanings and we, we start to get into overcoming with families what is one of the core things that gets them stuck. And we try to keep things very, very simple. So for us, when people come to us, we just see them as stuck. Mm -hmm. We see them as incredibly capable they have what they need to be able to do it. Now they can't find their way there yet, mm -hmm. but they're stuck in patterns and meanings that keep them from moving forward. And one of the major ones is this thing we call blame. Right. <clears throat> now for us, blame, don't get caught in the word. It's an attribution. Mm -hmm. That behavior happened because Jane is disrespectful. Yeah. That behavior happened because, but see that meaning turns out to be a filter that every time that behavior happens, a neutral behavior gets turned into disrespect mm. and the receiver responds as it as the meaning is to them. Mm. And then that sets up this kind of escalating pattern between people. So for us, again, one of the ways is, is we don't really care about hearing all the stories. So we're not mm. like traditional, traditional approaches and, and kids soon discover that we don't really care about mm. all that's happening. We care yeah. about what's going on. The, and, and that helps families move forward because that feels more relevant. Mm. It feels more important. It feels like something that, that addresses what they go through every day. Yes. So by, by taking that current approach, um, you know, I think it overcomes a lot of people's fear about therapy. Mm. And, you know, they think you can lay on a couch and talk about your parents yeah. and your grandparents. You know, and, and what kid? What vulnerable, kid? yeah. And, and there's any value in that, right? Yeah. 
Um, one thing as well that um, strikes me is that it's probably really kind of interesting for a young person who's used to being blamed and probably shamed, not only perhaps at home, but in school and from all these other services that their behavior is the problem. If therapists, again, can kind of in the in the reframing part, um, say to them, it's not just all about you, you know, you exist within this, this family within this ecosystem, and we're going to look at everyone in this, there must be something maybe a bit freeing about that, I imagine, or again, it's not all the finger pointing type of approach that they might be used to. Exactly, Jane. And that's one of the ways we build engagement, mm. right? And that's one of the ways that an FFT therapist is different than other therapists, is that the youth that expects me to come or any FFT therapist to come in and say, what did you do wrong? And why'd you do it? And I never ask those questions. Mm. In fact, sometimes I, I spend more time talking to a parent than the identified youth. That kind of blows them away because they're not used to that approach, right? So from our, we would see it as building engagement mm -hmm. because we would see it as showing. Remember I talked about the telling versus showing. Yeah. I would, I think that shows the young person that we don't blame them, mm -hmm. that we, so you can tell them that it has to do with everything. But the more valuable thing is when you show them by the way you ask I questions, you. where you focus your time, where you focus your attention. And we want to spread that out. Because for us, FFT works when there's balanced alliance. Mm. We have to have alliance with youth and with the parents. And that's a tricky thing mm -hmm. to happen when there's a lot of acrimony between the two parties. And just to go back to the meaning and how, you know, interactions and behaviors and relational patterns have meanings. Is that where the family problem definition comes in then, Tom? Yeah, and this is a term that we started using, gosh, in the early 2000s problem definition. And what it represents for us is one of the three things that go into how a family works. And so yeah, the, um, my colleague, Mark Stanton, who's retired from Azusa University and I recently, 2017, did a chapter for the Handbook of Clinical Psych on updating systems theory. Okay. And one of the things, that we, we did is in synthesizing all the kind of movement of system theory was boil down relationship systems into three components. One component is that old MRI idea or a behavioral idea of there's kind of a, a common pattern, right? When you, let's imagine your son does something and then you respond, you know, families kind of, they're pretty conservative. They do things in similar ways. So there is a behavior pattern. Mm -hmm. But more than that, it's meaning part, right? And so the meaning part is the attribution that each person puts on that. We call it a problem definition. Mm -hmm. It is how they define the problem. So that term comes from the therapeutic context, mm -hmm. right? Of relationships, right? In, in a regular, this happens in regular relationships, everyone, but we might call it something different because it's not mm -hmm. always about a problem. Mm -hmm. So for us, families get stuck because they come to the table, so to speak, with different ideas about what they're trying to solve. Right. So I don't think that there's ever been a family that I've worked with where they even see the problem as the same. Right. So one of the yeah. mistakes that therapists make is that they jump in and try to solve something when the parties involved are not even on the same page of what it is they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. So I can remember all sorts of experiences from my early career of, um, I was taught never let them leave without giving them homework or something to do, or something like, right? Right. Well, it was always a disaster. They never I'd did say. it. Yeah, I, I mean, and part of the reason is because at the beginning, and this speaks to the stages of change approach that mm -hmm. FFT is. At the beginning, people are stuck because of this lack of alliance and these different ideas about what the problem is. So for example, the parent says you're disrespectful and the kid says you're too controlling. They're, they're, there's no way they're going to come together and yeah. ever be able to solve that. So the first stages of FFT called engagement and motivation are all around this problem definition, mm -hmm. thing, right? It's overcoming and kind of trying to find a central place where it acknowledges both sides of it, right? Yeah, you're disrespectful, but that's misunderstood. And yeah, mm -hmm. you're controlling, but controlling comes from something. So in that early phase in FFT, we're looking for the noble intention behind the behavior. Okay. And reframing, which you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. is a technique 
central to psychotherapy. We've made it relational reframing okay. because the reframing is all, it's not making lemonade out of lemons. It's acknowledging that something happened. It's acknowledging that it's hard for someone and it's adding a different perspective either to their behavior or the behavior of the others. So we're looking for noble intention to pull that out. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the goal of that? That builds alliance between them, mm -hmm. gets them on the same page so that we can then move ahead in the different phases of F15. So and is this no problem definitions become very, very important in the early phases. And just just on the um the problem definition and kind of the the differing perspectives, is some of it maybe about the the unmet needs or unvocalized, maybe unrecognized needs that each of the parties have. For example, the 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 child or young person maybe wants a bit of freedom or to have friendships, albeit or maybe people who are not all that suitable or are dealing drugs. And the parents controlling behavior might be trying to keep them safe or trying to prevent them from going out and getting into further trouble. And each has that, you know, noble intent there or understandable aspect. So is it surfacing some of the things that are actually underneath? What it is, is exactly that, is pulling the noble intention of each, putting it in the central part of the table and focusing on that rather than the behaviors um, that that may lead to these blame sorts mm -hmm. of things. So I, I would never say to a youth, you're wrong, your parents not controlling. I would say, of mm -hmm. course, your parents are. But I think you miss the point of why. Mm -hmm. It comes from fear. Mm -hmm. It comes from being afraid. It comes from caring about you. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? No, mm -hmm. because they're always. So you, you do miss it, right? Mm -hmm. And then to the parents, when you look at him or her as disrespectful, right? What you see is a set of behaviors and what you might miss is that this is a way to be independent. Mm -hmm. This is a way to have space. This is, and they don't do it very well. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying they do it well, <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it comes from something that is a good thing that you actually want for them, mm -hmm. right? So the whole point in this first phase is getting away from the noise and getting to a bit what you talked about. I don't know that we would call it unmet needs, mm -hmm. but what we would just, but it is exactly what you said. We would see it as that, that as families move forwards and kids grow up, they want more and different things, mm. but families are in a pattern. Mm. So one of the big challenges for any relational system is as things naturally evolve, adjusting and being resilient mm. to adjust the patterns of that. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's a simple kind of stuck in a pattern approach. Yeah. And uh, so you mentioned the engagement and motivation phase. Um, and, and what is that? Then there are two other phases. Isn't that right? After, yeah. yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about those? please? Sure. So imagine you're trying to change something right. And you in between you and other people, you and your husband or you and your family or something like that. And the therapist helps you get to the point where you look at his, let's say your husband's behavior and you go, you know what? I don't like it. Mm. But it's good to know it comes from a good place, sure. right? Then the question is, what are you going to do, right? Because that's a good first step, but that's not, we're not done yet. Yeah. Because right? that's kind we're of still stuck. You're still stuck, but at least you're all stuck and, and you, you, you kind of have the feeling we're stuck together. Yeah. Rather, not that I'm stuck because of him or because of you, but yeah. we're stuck. So that opens the door to then a more typical approach where it's about building skills, mm -hmm. right? It's about helping change the pattern. So if you can imagine in the first phase of FFT, it's about changing these relational meanings, right? The meanings that people create that build what they think their relationship is. In the middle phase, the goal is to help them change what they do within the pattern. Okay. So for example, the example you had, instead of saying, no, you can't go out, we would help the parent problem solve for the youth. What's your worry? Out to what time? Out in what way? What will we do when? And to get into a collaborative working together with them to come to a new pattern or a new set of behaviors about how to respond to their emerging needs or the emerging mm -hmm. things that they want as they grow up. So for us, it's also interesting in this middle phase. You know, therapists always want lots of different skills. It doesn't take very many. Okay. It really, really 
does. And that's not the place for therapists to, to pay attention. It has really to do with some simple things. If you get on the same page, it's a matter of problem solving or negotiating, mm. right? It's, it's as simple as that. Steps of problem solving and negotiating. But along the way, it's easy to get stuck because people get angry. Yeah. People get hurt, right? They get hurt. It comes out in anger. So conflict management is a second mm. set of skills. How to not let conflicts escalate and kind of blow up the system. So we have negotiating skills, we have conflict management skills. Um, there are just with younger kids, some positive parenting activities that parents mm -hmm. can adopt in the child welfare system. That's a lot of what we do. So it doesn't take a lot of different skills in order to help families move forward, but that's in the middle phase. Mm -hmm. So what it really requires of somebody as the change agent in this relationship system is that they pay attention to phases of change. So at the beginning, don't go into fixing the behaviors, focus on these meanings. And mm. as that comes together, then shift what you do, meaning what the therapist does, shift it to a, what, how can we work together to solve it? So that's the, and then the latter phase, I think is a fascinating one. So, so I'll use an example I frequently use and my colleagues that may listen to this are gonna start laughing as soon as I start talking because they hear me say this before. <laughs> Um, I am a perfect person for changing things, but I am a terrible person for keeping the change going. Okay. I have, I have every kind of exercise activity there is. I used to be a runner. So I have, right. and I start things really, really well. I'm a good starter. Right. I'm a terrible finisher. So, and so take that analogy and put it with therapy, right? Yeah. So what you do is you get them doing new skills. There is going to be a challenge in the future. They're going to run into something. And FFT's ultimate goal, and I think any intervention, set of interventions or approach that works with a relationship system should have this as their objective. We want to empower them never to need us again. Mm. So what's the next step? If you're like me, the next step is what are you going to do when you have a relapse? Mm. What do you, how are you going to take the things that you learned about maybe going out and extend those to other things? Yeah. So in the last phase, we call it generalization, but there's really three poles. Generalizing what's happened around a few things and behavior change to other things, mm -hmm. but paying attention on maintaining the change. Mm -hmm. And that happens through relapse prevention. So it's a weird phase for therapists because things are going well. If they've been successful, things are going very well. And therapist has to come in and say, okay, things are going great, but they're not gonna continue that way. What are you gonna do when? What are you gonna do? How about, how about? <coughs> they're just very uncomfortable with that they think they're taking away being everything negative they... nellies kind of thing and, yeah. and yeah. yeah being a downer yeah, yeah. when when instead what you're doing is building resilience mm. to what's gonna come which is a challenge mm. so three phases engaging and in the engagement mo process motivating the family to lean into the treatment that's finding the noble intention identifying that they're both in it together. Then there's behavior change, the middle, which is about building skills to pattern change. <coughs> Excuse me. And then there's generalization, the last and third phase, which is about keeping it going, maintaining it and spreading it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so how does the uh, kind of the earlier or the mo more baseline form of FFT then differ to later iterations like the FFT gangs, which I, I, I believe exists, and also the FFT foster care, Tom? <laughs> so we've thought a lot about this and, and there's a variety of ways to think about this. So, um, you know, it is all the core FFT model. Mm -hmm. FFT gangs has the same three phases. <clears throat> FFT in foster care has the same three phases. We have FFT in child welfare. It has the same three phases. We're doing FFT in case management, same in three phases. But the context changes. And that's the critical thing, mm -hmm. right? Is we're, we've learned enough to know that the context of mental health is different than the justice context, which is different than the child welfare one working in a context where you're working with gangs or in foster care, it's a different context. <clears throat> so what that requires is to take the three phase model um, and put it into that context and say, what will that context require of the model to work there? So for example, in foster care, which by the way, we're doing around the country in America now, um, 
it's becoming because of its family focus, mm. right? Which is what foster care should be. Mm. Because of that, it's becoming very popular. It's still the three phases, except mm. what we do is now we have to do those three phases in a home that the youth lives in that isn't their own. Okay. And more importantly, we have to then replicate that when they go to their permanency home. So for example, in FFT foster care, it is the same three phases. We do it once with a foster family, mm -hmm. right? It has to be altered because it's not a biological family. <coughs> and then as the youth transitions to wherever their permanency is, um, the same therapist follows that youth to that permanency family and replicates FFT again. Mm -hmm. Now, why have the therapists follow them? Well, in foster care, one of the biggest issues is trauma, yeah. right? You've been taken away from your family. What do you, I mean, it's one thing to be put in a foster home. It's another thing once you attach to a foster parent to be ripped away from them and taken yes. back home. So they need to have, there need to be continuity and treatment. So part of the, what we call contextualization of the model to these different contexts is figuring that out. So we have the therapists follow them. So they have something to hold on to, an alliance they can trust, a relationship they can trust, so that it makes it easier for the youth as they follow. So your question was, are these adaptations? Yes. But let's think of the adapt let's think of the word adaptation carefully. It's more taking the core model and putting it and contextualize it into the setting in which it will be used. Okay. We're doing uh, the same thing. We're, we're actually working with young adults in New York City. Okay. Um, and there's a notorious um, justice facility in the city called Rikers Island, and they're yeah. closing it. Thank goodness. But these young people, young men, young women, are coming back out on supervised release. And we're using FFT as a way with young adults to reconnect them and build relationships with their families oh, okay. to give them the support they need to move forward. So again, same thing, right? Same mm -hmm. idea along the way. And just in the gang context, because that is somewhat similar, I suppose, to the, the, the Greentown approach that's trying to help young people move safely away um, from criminal networks, it, it is the only real difference there that context or, or are there differences? It's the okay. It's and then within each of these phases I described, mm. within each of the phases, you're going to say things differently, right? Okay. You're going to talk about different. But remember, FFT is a is a change process, mm -hmm. right? So it's all it's still engaging and motivate them. Mm. But you have to do, engage and motivate differently when a youth is a gang member than when they're not. Yeah. And you have to engage and motivate differently when the youth is in a foster home rather mm. than when they're not. So it's all about fitting these therapeutic interventions, these therapeutic ideas into the context in which they're going to work. And that now is a very interesting point to me because I think safety is, is obviously a very important and quite dynamic. So the risks can be higher if a, if a child or young person is, is in a gang or is in the foster care system, like they might've gone through more violence in the home or, or their behavior is even at the current time might involve more dangerous risk-taking or, or whatever. Um, so it does, does, does um, the presence or absence of safety at a given time impact on a person's kind of capacity to engage with the process i i, I think that it impacts people and dramatically mm. right i mean you know we know what kind of what kind of situation we're dealing in green town we we understand that you know if a youth leaves a gang that's a safety issue for them mm -hmm. right? just like it's a safety issue when they move into a gang i mean those are both safety issues leaving is no there's no less safe than joining mm -hmm. right so i mean it, it's a complicated thing and it does make make the choices and the options you have very difficult mm -hmm. same thing in foster care same thing in child welfare right i mean in this case feeling a sense of safety is important that's and that comes from relationship systems mm -hmm. right that's where safety comes from it doesn't come from a therapist connecting to a youth that may be an initial step to build it but long-term safety, security, and I would say what's the foundation of resilience for mm -hmm. someone 
comes from having a core relationship system that you're connected to. Mm. So even with the young adults I talked about in New York City that are, you know, they have done terrible things, some of them, mm. right? And they're involved in criminal activity all the time. Connecting them back to their family, like we're doing with Greentown, mm. right? Connecting them back to their family gives them what we would think of as a secure base. Mm. And that secure base is a relational safety, not mm. a, just a physical safety. I think the kids we're dealing with in, in Greentown, Jane, if you were to say you're physically unsafe, they're going to walk away and say, I'm not afraid of anything, <laughs> right? No, one, I'm not, yeah. right? But, but, but they're still psychologically mm. in this very unstable place that makes it really hard. Mm. So safety does make a difference. And um, to, to revert a bit to ad attachment, and you mentioned trauma in the context of FFT foster care, do attachment problems, whether on the part of the young person or their caregiver or both, and then past or ongoing trauma, again, make it maybe more difficult to be therapy ready. And by that, I mean, open and capable um, in that moment to maybe discussing relational patterns and functions? So that's a complicated question. You asked about four questions in there. So let me see if I can tease it apart, but hold me accountable to make yeah. sure I answer. Yeah. <clears throat> so first of all, and from an FFT perspective, discussing patterns might not be what we do. Okay. That's a therapist tool. Okay. But I would want to translate what I saw in a pattern. It's not about awareness. It's not about saying, look at the pattern between uh -huh. become aware. It is about becoming aware that the other person's response to you has a noble intention okay. that gets misunderstood. So, so, so I, I rarely say, look what happens. This happens. So I don't do that explanation of it. So first of all, openness to doing that is really not a big issue for us, okay. right? Because, because I'm thinking pattern, mm. but I'm acting in something relevant and responsive to how the client and the family thinks, and that's not going to be patterns. Mm. So I'll have to translate my picture in my head about patterns into words and, and descriptions. So it's more like when you struggle with that, you know, I think you see this and that, right? Don't you? Mm. So rather than at, if you know what I mean, mm. rather than, let me explain to you the big picture and the yeah. secret magic of what it's stuck in. So first of all, I'm not sure that I would do that. So let's go back to attachment. Now, what's really funny to me is that, as I said earlier, the word attachment in my early training didn't exist, except in one place, Bowlby. Mm. There was a, a early researcher that talked about childhood attachments. I actually did some research on that. And the, of course, Bowlby was the beginning of what's mm -hmm. become modern attachment theory. In the FFT world, Jim, Jim and, and Cole Barton talked about its relational functions, which is attachments have functional outcomes for people, the way you're attached. But they had an interesting perspective on it, which is in that sense, attachment is a kind of familiar zone rather than any kind of need right and we're all when we get into something we can just get into the pattern of doing it in that way so it's what we become familiar with and then something different becomes bad <clears throat> the other interesting early idea in fft that we still believe is is really important is that it, if you look at current day attachment theory it is extraordinarily cultural gender age-based mm. I mean, there are no four attachment styles across cultures. There are no yeah. four attachment styles across genders. It's very and we have yeah. simplified this really complicated thing into these attachment styles, and they just don't work across cultures. We work with so many cultures. If I were to look at the kind of simplistic attachment kind of models for today, they just don't help me. Right. They don't help you know, because some of those, because there's a, there's a, there's a value that gets put on those. Mm -hmm. This kind of attachment pattern is bad. This kind is right. good. Well, but move between cultures and the good and the bad change. Yes. Right. The good and the bad are much more culturally specific. Mm -hmm. So from an FFT perspective, our goal with attachment or relational function is to identify it and match to it. Mm-hmm rather than necessarily change it. We want to change the meaning and the patterns, but we don't want to change 
the attachment, we want to leave that more as it is. Now, again, we think of attachment as different, right? We think of attachment as kind of a glue that holds people together. So for us, um, you know, we need to identify the attachment and the way it looks, and we want to then respond within that rather than trying to take it away. And for me, it's a little like this. <clears throat> if I'm going to work with an individual person, if I try to change your personality, Jane, good luck. Mm. But if I try to change behavior, it's possible. Right. So if you look at attachment as part of the personality of a family, mm -hmm. who's to say that certain attachments are good or bad? Mm -hmm. It's more the meaning of the behaviors and the patterns within those attachments that have the good and bad connected. Now, I know all your listeners and viewers that are into attachment theory won't like that perspective. But, you know, the whole idea is attachment is important. It is the third central part of what goes into a family pattern, meaning and attachment. Mm -hmm. But it's how you look at attachment from a therapeutic perspective that becomes important, not as goals, yeah. but how a family is. And then you work with that. No, that, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. And just as well in the Greentown context, sometimes people are going through so many things, so many stressors in the here and now, like, you know, um, maybe a, a assaults by the network members on, on the house, uh, drug debt, just illness, serious mental health struggles, that the idea of even trying to do psychoeducation around relational patterns, it would be beyond their capacity in, in, in that moment. Um, so yeah, the, the again, the, the attunement and switching things up to match what's needed at that time. Um, and uh, the therapeutic case management dimension can be important there, I think, for for meeting meeting the um, needs. Um, we're, we, we're coming up to the hour, Tom, so I'm conscious of, of your time, but how do you get as a therapist, like how do you build alliance with the young person if they don't turn up? So for, exist, for example, if they're busy selling drugs on the street corner and they just won't come, no matter what you do, no matter how attuned you might like to be, uh, what do you do there? Do you just focus on the caregiver if they're willing to, to work with you? Well, I think it's a bigger question. It's the question we're dealing with with the uh, Greentown FFT team all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing that has to happen is you have to become part of the community in which that young person and family lives, right? So in this particular setting, what's happened with the Greentown FFT project is that they've made themselves a credible resource in the community. Mm -hmm. So then word passes, right? So then, you know, then you get word of mouth that that therapist that comes from the FFT project is not here to be part of the statutory system. They're not here to be part of the legal system. They're really here to be helpful. The second thing you mentioned earlier, which is really, really important is, is we try to think about therapy in a broad sense. Therapy doesn't just happen when you and I sit in chairs in a quiet room across from one another and have a conversation. Sometimes the most powerful therapy happens when you're standing on the street corner with someone and you have two or three words that make a difference. Mm -hmm. So part of it is in a context like this, realizing that therapy can happen in lots of different settings. So you mentioned case management. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things we discovered in child welfare, in the adult work and here in Greentown, which is one of the ways to become credible mm -hmm. is to be helpful. Right. Now, again, it, so being helpful by helping get resources when someone dies, get helping educational resources, support resources, mm -hmm. is you become a helpful, you become a helpful and credible resource. But then the next step is using that foot in the door to then say, what goes on between you and your son that keeps you from being, mm -hmm. you know, so it's just the foot in to yes. be able to talk about these things. It's also helpful. So, you, so the whole point here with a young person is being coming relevant. I mean, you have to have something to offer them. They're very transactional, mm -hmm. right? So you have to have something to offer. Some of that can come from the community rep, rep you have. Some of it comes from dealing with the parents and some mm -hmm. of it comes from having any kind of interaction. So what do we do? First of all, we would deal with the, the caregivers around engaging their youth because this isn't just a therapy thing. This is a family thing, yeah. right? So if they can't get the youth there, then they can't get the youth anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're going to begin with working on that, right? And we're going to try to change the caregivers' behaviors to make them more motivating and engaging to the youth. The second is the community reputation. Mm 
which is the Greentown project is mm -hmm. building. The kids here, you saw that therapist. What is that about? What, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is trying to find a way to get some piece of information to the youth around your interest in their part of the story. Mm -hmm. So you said something in, earlier, Jane, that was really important. And what you said was that um, how do you get a youth to sort of think that this is a valuable thing? And so part of what you, you have to be able to do is you have to find a way to be able to be important to them. And some of that might be, what is your part of the story? You know, no one's ever asked them. Mm -hmm. No one's ever cared much. No one's ever started by, hey, you're struggling with something what's mm. up you know, and starting with being interested in them mm. so it's finding some small way to get that started and then building on that mm -hmm. now let me just say this is no easy task this is the hardest task in the world right because you're 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 stepping into a relational system where that young person is part of a system that has to do with drug dealers, gangs, other people on the outside. They're estranged from their family and you're coming in in the middle of this and you're having to bring them together. Slow, hard, not for the faint of heart, right? Because you, you know you have to think about intervening in all sorts of ways. Yeah. You know, through a brief phone call, through a text, yeah. through sending a message through the caregiver to the youth. Hey, that therapist wants to know, the therapist thinks I'm the problem. They want to know what you think about it. Yeah. So it's all sorts of, now, once you get them, then it's on the therapist. Mm. Then it's on the therapist to find a way to make it relevant. And this is my final question, now, Tom, and it's a kind of a biggie. And what if you can't get in the door at all as a therapist? So not only does the young person not want to to avail of your help and services, but nor does the caregiver, perhaps because they're benefiting financially from, from crime or, or just because they have other <clears throat> stuff going on and they won't open the door and you keep turning up and saying, hi, I'm here again. And your persistence and, and efforts at, at whatever attunement um, keep being rebuffed. What do you do then? So this is where I think the brilliance of the Greentown uh, project has come in. And this is the work that you and your team, Sean, all of you have been doing, which is this has to be a multi-systemic approach. It can't be a, just a therapeutic approach. Mm. So it has to involve the authorities. It has to involve the local councils. It has to involve the housing people. It has to involve a lot of things. Now, lots of therapists think that it's not good when someone's forced to come see you. But mm -hmm. when they're forced to come to you, at least you get a moment to mm -hmm. do some of the things I talked about, right? So this, in, in this situation, why would they show up? I don't know. I, I kind of understand. Why would you show up? Why would you be there? It's not relevant to you. <clears throat> so if you can take a multi-systemic approach, if the guard can put pressure on the family, if the community, if the housing authority, those kind of pressures give you the chance to have a foot in the door to get started. Now, mm -hmm. does it solve it? No. But all we're looking for in FFT is a foot in the door to get started. Okay. Well, look, uh, Tom, thank you so much for your generosity and your ongoing work on this, this fascinating therapy. I've really enjoyed chatting to you. Thanks so much. Likewise, Jane. And again, thank you very much for inviting me. It's been delightful. I appreciate it. This has been Relationships Matter with me and Dr. Thomas Sexton. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>